What comes to mind when you hear the word cancer? What lives in your head about cancer? Is it fear? If so, fear of what? Chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, hair loss, pain? Does it make you think about loved ones, a parent, a partner, a sibling? Do you think about children, unborn children, children dying, death and dying from cancer? It makes me think about these children. These children are all sisters and brothers or first cousins. And all of their fathers, several of their mothers, and many of them died of cancer. The teen girl in the middle is my mother. My mother and two of her brothers were diagnosed with cancer and died. So when I think about cancer, I think about my mother and my uncles and the destruction of, of, of family by cancer. This also comes to mind when I think about cancer. My background is that I'm a pediatric surgeon and my passion, my clinical niche, is caring for kids with cancer. In the most technical sense, I remove tumors from the chest and abdomen of small babies and children. So when I think about cancer, I think of the disruption that it causes to the lives of my patients and their families. And all those things that you are feeling, I feel them too. Sadness, anger, fear. But those are not my only reactions to the word cancer. I am mostly inspired when I hear that word. I am overcome with an enormous sense of ambition and intention. It is a trigger word for me. It incites me. I think it is because of my family history with this disease. And it is also because of this child. This is an x-ray of a 10-year-old who developed a cough that didn't go away. And after multiple visits to and from emergency departments, an emergency room doctor obtained this chest x-ray. It shows a space occupying mass in the right chest. It's neuroblastoma, the most common cancer outside of the brain in children. It is a cancer of the nervous tissue, occurring most commonly in the adrenal gland or nervous tissue of the neck, chest, abdomen, or pelvis. And as a senior trainee in pediatric surgery, I was called to see this patient and his mother. And when we explained to his mother that in order to give him his best shot at survival, we needed to try to remove the mass. But in doing so, we could harm his lungs, his heart, and the major blood vessels to and from his brain. His mother was overcome with grief. When we made it to the operating room, just as we were about to make the opening incision, my mentor looked up to me and said, this tumor is coming out today. Let's go. It was us against the most natural of disasters, an anatomic catastrophe invading the delicate organs of a small child, threatening his hope for a future. We were awakened and inspired by his survival and by his life. And seven hours later, there it was, out of his chest, and on its way to the pathologist for review. We then had the privilege of going out to the waiting room and celebrating with his mother that we had removed the tumor in its entirety without any damage to any normal structures. This time, his mother was overcome with joy. The next morning, our young patient had many questions for us. When could he eat? When would the tubes come out? What about school? What about basketball? Could his friends visit? And then, in a most composed and courageous way, he looked right at me and said, what causes neuroblastoma? And why do I have it? And is there a cure? Those questions changed me. They changed me because we had no answers. We don't know what causes this cancer. And to look into the hopeful eyes of a 10-year-old and say, in all of modern medicine, no, you are not cured. It was deeply troubling, and I couldn't do it. And in that quiet moment of questions and chaos, the dream was shaped. 
I could see it, I could feel it. Among all the patients and all the problems, this was it. There was something special about this problem, something about this kid that grabs me and wouldn't let go. You see, what he had just taught us was, yeah, we could diagnose the complex problem, perform an elegant operation safely. But there remained the fact that cancer would recur, and neuroblastoma was likely still lurking in his blood vessels and in his lymph nodes. That fact we didn't change, not with our surgery and not with chemotherapy. Therefore, his direct questions and his curiosity had just reminded us this was not enough. It was not enough because he was not cured. And in our conversations with him, what happened, and maybe this has happened to you too, I realized that in order to stand in this full space, this full space of healing, we really needed to be open to what was in fact an evolution. We had to flat out accept the challenge, receive the directive to not just stay on the field, but to take up the battle. And that moment, and probably many others prior to that, led to this. My goal and my dream is to cure cancer. My team and I have set out to make discoveries and to develop a cancer treatment that will obtain curative outcomes for children with neuroblastoma. I accept responsibility and accountability for this problem. It is a part of me. I think about it when I wake up in the morning and I think about it before I go to sleep at night. The message from that young patient was this. Why aren't we aspiring for the extraordinary? And couldn't we at least try? Isn't that all we can do, is take clues from our personal and professional experiences and allow them to move us, to inspire us? Maybe it is about freeing ourselves in those magical moments and allowing the disruption and the chaos to set our goals, to drive us to our purpose. I did that for neuroblastoma. And when I did that, you know what I found? That it is the absolute perfect cancer to study, poised for a curative discovery. Here's an example of why. Cancer is no longer a secret. Because the entire human genome has been mapped, we know what normal looks like. And we also know what the cancer genome looks like. So cancer researchers have been discovering all the DNA mutations that turn a normal cell into a tumor cell. There's never been a more exciting time to study cancer. And what is even more compelling about neuroblastoma, which is why we need to do this work right now, is that unlike most cancers, only a few DNA alterations have been discovered in neuroblastoma tumors. Even more exciting, the presence of these DNA alterations are the single most reliable predictor as to whether or not children with neuroblastoma will die. Could this mean that if we understand how DNA alterations lead to chemotherapy resistance, could that be a clue in curing neuroblastoma? DNA is the heart of a tumor cell. We know that mutations happen when DNA damage occurs. DNA damage from normal metabolic processes, UV light, and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy causes DNA damage and DNA strand breaks. And the cell responds by either repairing its DNA or instructing cell death. Could it be that the road or the answer or perhaps even our hypothesis, is that a tumor cell gains resistance by repairing its own DNA. We already know that resistant tumors, the ones that relapse, somehow figure out a way to patch up their DNA. So our lab is interested in these very special tumor cells, the ones that can recognize the broken DNA and efficiently put the ends back together again. We think this allows the tumor to grow. 
Imagine if that is the missing puzzle. Tumor cells with a special ability to repair their own DNA. Imagine further that we could block that process. If we are right, perhaps children no longer dying of neuroblastoma. And if we are wrong, then we are positioned to be guided to the next question. To do this, we have assembled an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, and we have rallied believers in our work. And last summer, we wrote to the federal government about the DNA repair capacity of neuroblastoma. That happens in the form of an R01 grant, the pinnacle of one's academic career. We spent days and hours scrutinizing each experiment, analyzing each data piece, crafting each word to carefully convince the NIH that our idea was the next best step to understanding the cure to neuroblastoma. On this first submission, they didn't accept our grant. But you know, I think that it's because I know that I have been uniquely guided to do this work. We immediately start to strategize how we would send the grant right back. We would address each weakness one by one. And how really all we needed to do was a few more experiments, learn a few more techniques. But the one thing we knew is that we weren't giving up. So I think the message in all of this is multifold. Our personal and our professional experiences, they shape our dreams. They lead us to our destiny. Our challenge is to be open to the clues, the quiet nudge that moves us to our life's purpose. And when that happens, is our fight in the battle unshakable, unyielding, because we know that we have been brilliantly guided to this place. And then, that one magical moment, preceded by many magical moments, will be that one critical milestone on our journey with the extraordinary. Thank you for your time.